John 10, 1 to 4. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Can you please welcome Pastor George Saloom? Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, good morning. Please grab a seat. Thank you, team. Oh, the Lord is good this morning. The Lord is good all the time, amen. The Lord is amazing. Jesus is incredible. We love the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, don't we? God, our triune God. Anyone, anyone care to explain the Trinity? <laughs> Here's a sentence for you. He is, our God is three, three in one. He is one being, but three persons. You are, you are one being and one person. He, he is one being, God, who is three persons. When you worship God, God is a triune God because he is showing us that we, he is a community. So, so that is a bit of a clue about what we need to be, is a community. No man is an island, we know the saying. That's a biblical saying. We're all designed to be in community, we're all designed to be around each other, to, to love each other, to, to, to um, rub each other up the wrong way, to, to rub the edges off. You know the person that irritates you, they're there for a reason, the Lord put them there. <laughs> Suck it up, princess. They're there to rub that little edge off you sometimes. And uh, why? Because we're all meant to be part of community. And, and uh, I love the, this, the, this community, this house. Uh, and the broader, the broader church, the broader church of God throughout the globe. Uh, isn't it incredible that, that no matter what has happened to Christians throughout all the ages, for a 24-hour period, all around the world, every second is filled with people worshiping God all over the globe. Isn't that incredible? That the church of the living God is still powerful, it's still strong, it is growing. The more persecuted it is, the greater it gets. Um, this, is why, this is why we're instructed to pray for the persecuted church. Uh, and this is why Jesus says to us, get ready, you will, be, you will be persecuted. And have joy in it. We try to avoid persecution, but Jesus says, no, no. Look forward to it, because they persecuted me. <laughs> Sorry, you're gonna get persecuted too. But be in joy, because when you're persecuted, I come to my fullness, you'll come to your fullness in Christ. And so, so it's good to be in community with you today, because we are part of a triune God who is community. And as, as, as Lisa was saying today in the scriptures, and I'm gonna be mentioning that, so it's not, it's not a accident that we're speaking and praying about trust today. Um, and, and the things of God, and th those sort of aspects or uh, characteristics of God. It, it's ordained of the Lord, because I'm, I'm speaking about that today. Um, and as you saw the scripture there just a moment ago, um, Jesus is speaking about being a shepherd, talking about what it means to be a shepherd. And it's interesting, you've got to take big note when Jesus starts to describe himself. Sometimes we, we try as Christians to describe Jesus by trying to piece some things together. But there's no, there's no mistaking who Jesus is when he decides to describe himself. And when he does, we need to stop. As a matter of fact, if you put up our verse one again of chapter 10, uh, the words there, most assuredly. The moment Jesus says, most assuredly, what he's saying to you and I is, trust me, listen to me, listen to, listen. Yo, listen up. Are you listening to me? You're not listening to me, George. Listen to me. So it, it, he's arresting our attention when he says, most assuredly, I say to you. He's about to give a deep truth. And generally, it's connected to what's happened just before. So something has happened a moment ago, and Jesus is now teaching his disciples, I want you to listen to me carefully because I'm about to give you a profound statement, like as if everything Jesus said wasn't profound. But right now, I'm about to tie it up to what just happened and you're not gonna understand it, so listen to me carefully. 
For some reason, I've started using that in my vernacular when I'm talking to people. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll stop and I'll say, like to Geraldine, um, Geraldine, you're not listening to me. Geraldine, listen to me. Uh, and, uh, and sort of he starts laughing at it now. He says, you say that often. I, oh, do I? Okay. It's maybe because you're not listening. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and then my, 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 one of my best friends and business partner, Pedzi, uh, has got tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is a thing for all you f- females out there, wives. Your husband may have tunnel vision. You're like, what does that mean? He puts blinkers on and just does that thing. And when he's doing that thing, if you ask him to take the bin out, go pick up the kids, do the dishes, if he says yes, he hasn't heard you. It's called tunnel vision. And I'm, not, and I'm not telling all the men to be, don't use that as an excuse. Okay, don't use that as an excuse. Come on, come on. <laughs> it is a condition, but that's what makes them successful because they, 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 they can hone in on one thing and focus. So what you've got to do, like I've got to do with my, uh, with my mate Pedzi, is I've got to grab his attention. I've got to, I've, I can't give him information I've learned unless he's looking at me in the eyes. When he's looking at me in the eyes, if he's doing an email or he's on the computer and I'm going, hey, mate, um, X, Y, Z, X, Y, and I'm, I'm giving him a sentence and he's going, yeah, 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 I know, yeah, yeah. It hasn't, it's gone in one ear, out the other. Focus. And so when I say, okay, I need you to look at me. Pedzi, look at me, bro. Hang on, just tell me when you're free. You give him five minutes, he looks up at me. I know he's now going to hear everything I've said because his tunnel vision's gone from here to now here. This is what most assuredly means. It means, give me your tunnel vision right now because I'm about to say something that will change the way you view me. And so when Jesus starts to describe himself as the shepherd, we need to stop and listen. And so what has happened previous to this? I won't go into the story fully, but in John chapter nine, you can read it yourself. It's the moment where Jesus heals a blind man who's been blind from birth by spitting into the ground, creating clay, and rubbing it on his eyes. I love Jesus. I mean, we've talked about this before. If he did that two or three times in the Bible, we'd have a spitting ministry. We've, done, we've said this. There'll be spittoons everywhere. People who, have, who produce saliva, um, you know, naturally, a lot of it. You know, those people who talk and spit comes out all the time. Well, that, they'll be like really revered and honored and okay, go into the back room, spit, some, spit before you come. We don't need your money, we need your spit. Um, <laughs> 10, 10 o'clock and already people are starting to vomit. Um, but I love that he just did things so differently. And so in this case, he, he makes the clay, puts it on the blind man's eyes and tells him to go wash it. He washes it and he is healed. He is rejoicing. His family's freaking out. The, the religious people of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, summon him to a meeting. <laughs> Don't you love religious people in meetings? <laughs> yeah. You'll get that on the drive home. Uh, summon everyone to a meeting. Let's have a meeting. We need to have a meeting before the meeting. And so they summon him into this big consortium meeting and they ask him, what happened? Tells them the story. And they go out and rah, 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 with each other. They come back in and say, explain to us again what happened. And he explains it again. And then they ask him again and he says, are you guys deaf? Do you need healing? He doesn't say that, but that's pretty much what he's saying. In the sense, I just told you, why am I telling you again? Who is this man? I don't know. His name's Jesus. He just came out of nowhere. Well, he did it on the Sabbath. Whoa. He worked on the Sabbath. That's disgusting. And so they're getting angry with him, so angry that they excommunicate him out of the church or out of the synagogue. And this, this, this man probably didn't give a rip because <laughs> now he can see, okay, which means he can work, which means he can get a livelihood, look after his family, uh, a future, a hope. He's got vision for his life. Now there's, I don't know, some religious old people in a room somewhere telling him, bruh, 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 get out, see you later, I'm out. And so they think they're affecting his life, but really he's out there rejoicing. And so Jesus now, is expl- he's, he's, he's heard about this and he's telling his disciples, most, most assuredly I wanna say to you that I'm a shepherd. And it seems like it's a disconnect. Jesus, you know this guy just got excommunicated, but now you're talking about yourself. Anyone know any Christians like that? No one? Okay, good. Everyone's, everyone's lovely here. All right. But Jesus was show, uh, illustrating a picture. He says, 
there is a doorkeeper. The keeper opens the door to the shepherd. Now let me paint this picture for you because, because we, don't, we, we, we live in the urban industrialized nation. Uh, most of us here haven't been farmers of sheep, so we don't understand. But, but what happens is the sheepfold is a place where the sheep are kept at night. And in, in Jesus' time, and, and, and some till now, but obviously we have more, more advanced technology, uh, there would be a porter or a doorkeeper that would wait at the door, and this, this sheepfold would be covered with, with a big wall, a, a big uh, rock wall. And there would be this opening, and, and the doorkeeper would, would lie there, would sleep there at night, in order to make sure wolves wouldn't come in, uh, sheep wouldn't get out. And, uh, and, but, but that person would only allow the, she, the, the shepherd to come in when they recognize them. And so what Jesus is saying is that, the shepherd comes in through the door, but thieves come in over the wall. And so, and, and that will become relevant in a moment, but he's starting to describe who he is. He says, I am, I am the, the, uh, the shepherd, the doorkeeper opens for me. Then he says, the sheep hear the shepherd's voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. See, the fascinating thing about this, you can Google this yourself, sheep only respond to their shepherd's voice. Sheep aren't as dumb as we have been told they are or we think they are. They are quite um, prone to distraction, which is why we're described as sheep. But also, sheep are quite intelligent in the sense that they can pick people's faces, voices, and smells. They did a test where uh, 85% of sheep could pick uh, not their shepherd's face, but just the face that they were shown and rewarded for. So they were shown a face on, an, on, a, on, a, on a screen, and uh, then they were rewarded when they, reckon, when they saw the face. They did that several times. And then they started showing two faces, and they, they, would, they would go, when they went to the right face, they'd get, it, they'd get a reward. Then they started showing three faces. And so 85% of the time, a random person from the crowd, they could, they could teach them to recognize the face, and they would recognize it 85% of the time. When it's their shepherd, it was 100% of the time. Without any prior recognition, they just had four or five photos. One of them was their shepherd. They'd go straight to that photo and they'd get rewarded once they did that. And so, uh, uh, and the voice. And there was another video, you can see this. There's actually several of them on YouTube uh, where, where several people go up to a sheepfold and they start doing the same call that their shepherd does to the sheep. You know, Weird calls, I'll try to mimic it. It's gonna sound horrible, so bear with me. Things like, nah, nah, nah. Yeah. I, mean, just, I suppose they can't call them by name. Johnny, Malcolm, Hazel. Now they're making noises. Yeah. And so several people would go up to the sheepfold and make, make that noise really loudly, and the sheep wouldn't respond. Eating the grass, no, no response. As soon as the shepherd utters the first sound, the sheep look up, put their head up, look over, and they all run over to him. Happens over and over and over again. It's fascinating to watch. Fascinating to watch. And so Jesus, when he says that the shepherd calls his sheep, they hear, the sheep hear the shepherd's voice, he calls them by name and leads them out. He brings the, his own sheep out. He goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. This is extremely important, what Jesus is saying to us. Because Jesus understands as sheep, we're talking about us now, as some white sheep, brown sheep, black sheep, clean sheep, dirty sheep, big sheep, little sheep, dreadlock sheep, shorn sheep, you're still a sheep, doesn't matter what you are. Isn't that right, Greg? Still a sheep. All of us are sheep. Uh, and, and, and he's saying that as sheep, we get used to voices. We get used to listening to a voice and then following it. And what Jesus is trying to say is we need as sheep to hear our shepherd's voice or the good shepherd's voice and follow that voice. Otherwise, we will follow other Shepherd voices. I wonder how many voices speak to us today. I wonder how many voices actually move us along in our walk of life. I wonder 
if it's the, if it's the voice of our employer or our spouse, if it's the voice of my own need or my own desires, is it the voice of my own uh, achievements or goals? Which voice, which shepherd am I listening to? And how do I know which shepherd I'm listening to? And this is what Jesus starts to tell us. The voice with whom we start to follow, the voice with whom we start to prick our ears and start to turn towards, more often is the voice of our shepherd, whichever shepherd that is for you. Jesus is telling us that the shepherd that needs to be doing that is he, he himself as the good shepherd. But he goes on and he says, he starts to describe what a good shepherd does, what he as a shepherd does. It's actually one of the longest narratives that Jesus talks about himself when he, when he, in, in the Gospels, in any four of the Gospels. When he talks about himself, um, it's generally very short. It's a sentence or two. But in this one, it's almost a whole chapter of him talking about himself in this light, which makes it even more important to understand why he does this. But he goes on, let's read. I'm gonna go to verse seven. It says, then Jesus said to them again, so he's now giving them the illustration of the shepherd, and he says, please excuse me while I uh, get my glasses out. (laughs) I have to do it, Jimmy, I'm sorry. It's horrible. This is, this is really bad. This is really bad. Thank you. Someone just said, welcome to the club. <laughs> Verse seven. Then Jesus said, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Why don't I read the Bible like this all the time? Why am I struggling doing these ones? Okay, last month when I was preaching here, I, I didn't realize how bad it was until I started doing this. And I went, okay, this is, this is real bad. Okay. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Verse nine, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now listen to this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life. (laughs) Listen, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Number one, (laughs) Jesus is the good shepherd because he gives his life for us. Now he doesn't just say in death. We assume that what he's talking about there is that he is about to die for us which he is talking about that, but he doesn't just mean that. Jesus didn't just die for us. Jesus is still to today our advocate, our propitiation, our healer, our deliverer. Jesus' whole existence now is for us. Ooh, I know that's a bit, ooh, he's, he's, there's some theology here. I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you. When Jesus died as a human being, he didn't rise up again as the spirit, God stuff. He didn't rise up as a spirit. He rose up in a glorified body, a body that could appear and disappear, that can walk through walls, that could fly, that, that, that could, could transfigure, like walking with those two men on the road to Emmaus. They knew Jesus, they walked with him, they were his disciples, yet they didn't recognize him for hours while they're walking and he's explaining to them until he broke bread and then all of a sudden, they recognized him. Trust me, it wasn't dim lighting. (laughs) And so Jesus goes from God, made of God stuff, spirit, he becomes a human being, he doesn't return back to spirit in his former former, uh, being, He goes and for the rest of eternity now has got the body that you and I will have because he is the firstborn of many. 
into eternity. So Jesus didn't just give his life once and for all, which he did, but he does it for the rest of eternity. That's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Then he contrasts it by saying in verse 12, but a hireling, what is a hireling? One who works for wages. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Now let me just bring that back to what I was talking about a moment ago. Who are the hirelings in our lives? They are the shepherds who are not Jesus. Because those things, those thoughts, those people who we will follow as opposed to Jesus' voice don't care for you like Jesus cares for you. Don't own you like Jesus owns us. He paid the price for us, which means he owns us. When you pay the price for a product, you own that product. Jesus owns us because he, he paid the ultimate price for us and continues to do so. And because of that, he did it because he loved us and still loves us and cares for us. And so he's saying, be careful of those hirelings out there, those things that may take your attention away because they don't care for you. They may look like they do, but they don't. You may look like you do, but you don't. You think you love yourself. You may. Most of us don't know how to love ourselves. But Jesus can show us how to love ourselves. Well, should I love myself, Pastor George? Of course you should. The Bible says, love others as I've loved you and that you need to, you need to understand how to love yourself. Love others how you, as, as you love yourself. You, you, you've got to understand why. I don't love myself in arrogance or ignorance. I love myself because of who I am to the Lord. My value is what the Lord says my value is. Your value is what the Lord says your value is. Not what people say, not what teachers say, not what your spouse says, not what your children says, or your employer. It's what Jesus says you are and who you are. And therefore, if I'm valuable to Him, I know I am valuable. Each one of us have got superpowers. They're called gifts. They're callings. They're the Spirit of God, where it all comes from. And those superpowers are meant to bless the world around us, to show them who Jesus is. But hirelings come, what do they do? Hirelings come to take that away from us. And the moment tragedy comes, they run. And so he says, don't trust them. Verse 14, here's the next thing a good shepherd does. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. That's what a good shepherd does. That's Jesus. I know my sheep. A hireling doesn't know. Jesus knows the sheep. So what Jesus is saying is, Hey, I know you. You may think to yourself, oh man, my, my, you know, Jesus, do you really know me? Do you really love me? Do you know how horrible I am? Do you know what I've done in my life? I am horrible as a person. Jesus says, I don't see that when, you, when my blood has washed you clean. I see you as the redeemed person. And even if you don't know the Lord and you're hearing the sound of my voice or you're sitting in this room today, you don't know the Lord. He hasn't washed you because you've not asked him to do that. His love still extends to you through the cross. You know, we, we can make a mistake when we tell the world, God loves you, and stop the sentence there. We make a mistake when we do that because that's half the story. The other half of the story is God loves you and demonstrated that love on the cross. You now need to accept the cross in order for His love to cover you. Because otherwise what we're saying is, God loves you and you can stay in your sin and it's all gonna be okay. Now see, God's love is powerful. It's not a toy, it's not a toy. Let's not play with that. God's, if God's love was, if God did that and extended His love unconditionally to everyone irrespective of what they did, they must be saved in spite of their sin. That's how powerful God's love is. But God demonstrated His love on the cross through Jesus Christ and said, I've done it all, it is finished. And because of His goodness and His kindness, He gives us the ability to choose, do we wanna accept that love or do we not? And so this love is I know you, I know you. 
So don't hide away from him. You know, you know, sheep, 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 sheep can get dirty, right? Like you've seen the wool. Like not, not, not trying to be crass or anything, but if you've ever been around animals, they don't have porcelain toilets and toilet paper. I'll just put it that way. And so when they come to the shepherd, they're not clean all the time. They're dirty. The shepherd doesn't reject them because they're dirty. He doesn't reject them because they're dirty. They know his voice. They come to him. And I'm talking about you and I, those who know the Lord. I'm not talking about the unsaved. We come to the Lord sometimes dirty. And this is why in, in, in 1 John chapter 2, it says, And when you sin, <laughs> there is one who is our propitiation, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. This is part of what it means to walk with this good shepherd. It means that he is always advocating for us, that no matter what happens in your life, no matter how dirty you get, the shepherd is right there. We just got to hear his voice and go. And he doesn't say, you're too dirty, you need to go wash yourself. No, he says, come, come, I'll sort you out, come here, come on. That's what it means to walk with a good shepherd. It doesn't mean that every time I, I do, I make a bad mistake or say something silly or, or, or think something or act in a, in, in a particular way, I need to flog myself and ask the Lord, 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 wash me with your blood again so I am forgiven. No, you're already forgiven. You are washed, you are cleansed in His eyes. It's done. But that's not an excuse. And so, so what happens is, immature Christians, when I say this, ask me this question. Immature Christians, listen. They say this. Well, does that mean that if I'm saved, I can do whatever I want and I'll still be saved? Now see, that's immaturity. That's immaturity. Because maturity lets you understand when you know the Lord in maturity that I, don't, I, I, I become less dirty when I know the Lord because I'm behaving out of holiness, not towards holiness. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be good and pleasing towards God because it is pleasing in His eyes to behave this way. And so my role is to try and please the Lord, not to try and please me. And so I don't look for the line, which is so human thing to do. Where is the line? Where's the edge? Where's the edge between holiness and sin? And I want to live right there, right there. And if I could just get there, I'm happy. Some of us live like this. It's like, no, I'm holy. I'm holy. Okay, I can't get up. <laughs> I'm, that's going to hurt later. I'm holy because I've got one leg in the camp of holy, but I'm living in, in my own filth. But God's saying, no, 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 no. Maturity says, I live here. All right, I might make mistakes, but I live here. That's what 1 John 2 was about. And so he says, I know you come. He goes on. He says in verse uh, 15, as the, uh, no, sorry, let me jump to verse 17. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. Now listen to this. And I have power to take it up. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up. Hang on, I thought the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> and I have power to take it up again. What is, what is he saying? I am God. That's basically what he's saying. <laughs> Right? That's what he's telling everyone. I'm going to lay my life down because I choose to. And then I'm going to take it up again because I'm God. This is why they want to kill him. Because to them, that's heresy. Then he says, this command I have received from my father. So now he's, he's telling everyone what his father's saying to him. He goes on, verse 19, he talks about division and the, and the Jews start arguing, he's got a demon, you know, I don't know if he's got a demon. He's, oh, he can't have a demon. He can't be doing all this stuff. And, and, and they're getting really upset with him. And then Jesus in verse 25, let's jump to verse 25. He understands what's going on, you know, and he says, I told you, because they, they want a miracle. Uh, show us, tell us that you're the Christ plainly. He says, I've told you, and you do not believe, in verse 25. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. He's talking to the to the Jewish people of the time who, cho who chose not to see him as the Christ. Isn't that interesting? Verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 
Now, when Jesus repeats himself, it's not because he forgot what he said. They follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone, listen, snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And now he says again, I and my Father are one. I am God and I'm telling you to listen to me. When you walk with the Lord, when you know that Jesus is your shepherd, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. There's no disease, there's no sickness, there is no person, there is no thought process, there is nothing that can snatch you out of the Father's hand. I do not care, not in a, not in a caring sense, but I do not care about the thing you're going through because that thing is not greater than God. That thing cannot snatch you out of God's hands. I, I have a mental illness. Fantastic. It's not greater than God. It cannot take you out of God's hand. I have a disease. It's terminal. I'm going to die. Okay. What happens if you die? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The only people that don't like dying are the ones who are stay behind, who don't know the, like, who, who know the Lord. Out of all those who know the Lord, I understand I've come, I've come to a place in myself that if I pass away, I will not miss my family. That doesn't mean I don't love my family. That doesn't mean they're not going to miss me, oh, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe after that statement, they're like, you're gone. You're out. But, you, but understand what I said. I'm not going to miss my family because I'm going to be with the Lord. Why would I care about earth when I'm with the Lord? No eye has seen, no ear has heard of the amazing things that the Lord has prepared for us. Are you kidding me? Every movie, every book ever written, every poem, every, every, everything ever written cannot ima- has never even touched on the, what the Lord is going to give to us? Wow. So I may look at the earth and go, Hey, that's cool. I used to live there. But now I'm here. You're going to be the same if Jesus is your shepherd. And so we have a fear of, of not being healed or not being changed or not being, not being uh, um, whatever we need, whatever we look for and believe for it and, and, and ask God for it. I'm not saying don't believe for it. I'm not saying that at all. But understand that God is still worthy to be praised whether you get it or not because eventually you are going to get it in heaven. That's where it's going to happen. Death is only a transition into what God has promised you. Death is not the end. Let me say that again. Death is not the end. It is only a transition into what God has promised you. Eternal life, healing, hope. Why am I explaining what Jesus is all about? Why am I explaining why, going into lengths about why, why Jesus is the good shepherd and what that means? Anyone heard of the five love languages? Five love languages, for those who don't know what they are, it's very basic, it's very cool for any friendship you have or relationship. The five love languages that most people exhibit, one or two as their main ones, are the five uh, acts of service, words of encouragement, physical touch, gifts, or quality time. You can go and go Google five love languages and do the test and have a laugh with your, with your friends and partner about how cool you are. But you know God has got a love language? God has got a love language. He does. And when you, read, when you read the totality of the Bible, you understand what God's love language is. It's not quality time. It's not physical touch. <laughs> it's not words of affirmation. I forgot the others. It's not those. God's love language is trust. What do we think faith is? Without faith, we can't please God. That's trust. What does God want to do with us? He wants to trust us. What does God want us to do with Him and His voice? Trust Him. This is why He describes us as sheep. Sheep just trust the shepherd's voice. They don't ask questions. What do you mean you want me to go to the left? I don't want to go to the left. I like the grass on the right. I don't want to go to the left. What do you mean you're dipping me in some stuff? I don't want to be dipped in some stuff. I hate liquid. 
What do you mean you're shearing me? Why have you got this metal thing on my body? You're taking off now, I'm freezing. Why are you doing that? Why have you got this hook and keep going on my neck and pulling on my legs and, and pulling me over this way? And why is there a dog nipping on my heels all the time? They don't ask questions. He just goes, <whistles> and the sheep go <whistles> that way, <whistles> over there. They implicitly trust the voice of the shepherd. It's not wrong to ask questions to understand, but we don't do that. We question God, why God, why God, why not, why God, why not, why not, why, 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 why can't I, why can't I, why can't I be, why hasn't it happened? Yeah, stuff you got, I don't care. Oh, sorry, you're all oversaved here. I didn't realize none of you talk to Jesus like that. You may not say it verbally, but it's happening in your head. And in your heart, there's some season of our life when you walk through. And if that's not you, you haven't lived life yet. Life comes with some baggage. Life comes with some twists and turns that we don't plan on. And then we, the voice you're listening to is the one that will only navigate you through those dark times. And so when it's Jesus, we trust that voice implicitly. And as the good shepherd leads us, he lays down his life. That's why Jesus is describing this, because he's telling us, trust me, I am good. And I'm not talking about human good, because our goodness is filthy rags. Only God is good. Jesus said that to the, to, the, to the rich young ruler. Why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, that, that's God. God is good. Actually, God is the measure of good. With God measured, He is the measuring stick of good. Anything other than God is bad. <laughs> Just want to encourage you today that in all our goodness, it is nothing compared to the Lord, amen? So I want to close it here. I want us to stand as we, we get ready to worship the Lord. And as we, as we start to worship the Lord today, I want you to worship from a place. As, I, as I've been preaching, I've, I've felt the Holy Spirit been talking to me about some deep, deep, deep secrets that some of us have in our hearts. Maybe some hurts or, or, or discouragements or um, uh, words of reproach that people have, have felt from others. Maybe, maybe you look at your life and you think, I'm not worthy of all this. I understand that he's a shepherd, but... I'm not worthy, I'm, I'm, I'm more like a goat sometimes than I am a, a sheep. But I want you to know today, and, if, and I feel the Father saying to you today, that you are my sheep, that if I am your shepherd, you are my sheep. You are my sheep. Your life does not determine whether you are His, his sheep or not. What He has done determines whether you are His sheep or not. When we accept His love and, he is, and we listen to His voice, we are His sheep. And so... And so irrespective of what's happened in your life, irrespective of where you are right now, the feelings, the things that may dredge up in your mind, and even for those, listen to me, who are high and mighty in our own self. Whether you're low or you're mighty, both of those are gonna end in not a great place. We need to come to a place of humility in God, a humility to understand He is my shepherd. I am His sheep. I listen to His voice. I am trained to listen to it and I follow Him. And so as we come to worship, I want you to do this. I want you to, let's close our eyes right now. I want you to hear my voice for a moment. As we come to worship, don't just sing the songs, the, the words of the song in repetition or parrot them, but I want you to sing the words. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter which song it is, it's declaration and love towards God and, and who you are in Him. And, and if you don't like the words, don't sing the words, sing to Him. Sing to Him. It doesn't matter what words you're singing, that, they don't have to be in line with the song. You just sing words of adoration and love and submission and worship to our shepherd. For He is worthy above all else to be praised, to be glorified, to be honoured. We worship you, God. We honour you, Jesus. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your glory. You are our true shepherd. You are our shepherd. The only, the only voice that we need to be listening to, you are that one. You are the only one that we need to be listening to. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we worship you right now. Amen and amen and amen.